Oh man, I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this one, but here it goes. Guys, we gotta talk about the 1966 World Cup. Most of you, including myself, are way too young to have been alive to watch the 1966 World Cup. But if you're an avid football fan, you probably have heard about Hurst's controversial goal, or Eusebio's masterclass, maybe even Pele's miserable time. And if you're English, you've definitely explored your country's only ever international title in one way or another. Just to sample a remnant, even if indirectly through the past, of how it would feel to have your nation lift a World Cup title. And oh how glorious it must have felt. Unless you're South American. In that case, the year 1966 leaves quite a bit of a different taste in your mouth. Especially if you're Argentine, Uruguayan, or Brazilian. I guess it's fair to say that depending on who you ask, opinions about the tournament will be very different. Some might even say that it was completely unfair, and I'm here to tell you whether or not this is the case. As the English in their all white, and Argentina in their iconic blue and white stripes, walked out onto the pitch at Wembley Stadium for their quarterfinal matchup, not one of them, nor the 90,000 fans packed to the brim like sardines, or even the millions watching on TV or listening in on radio could have predicted the absolute chaos that was about to ensue right in front of their eyes. The game starts off a pretty cagey affair, mostly a battle of the midfield. Lots of tackles come flying in, and German referee Rudolf Kreitlin can be seen talking to players trying to keep things from getting out of hand. But then, just 35 minutes into the match, Argentine captain Antonio Rattin is sent off. The official reason for the sending off? Foul language. But the crazy part about this, Kreitlin didn't understand a word of Spanish. So how on earth could he have sent Ratin off for bad language if he didn't even know what he was saying to him? Ratin then requests for a translator because he doesn't understand the reason for his ejection. But his complaints fall on deaf ears, and after a little while, he's escorted off the pitch by guards while beer cans are being thrown at him by the English crowd. Argentina are now forced to play the remaining 60 minutes down a man. What was next to follow is known in Argentina as El Robo del Siglo, the robbery of the century. England would go on to commit 33 fouls and Argentina only 19. Despite this, the English received no bookings while the Argentines received four bookings and a sending off. In just 13 minutes from full time, Hurst heads home the winning goal to put the home nation into the semifinals. At full time, England's right back George Cohen attempts to swap shirts with an Argentine player as is custom after big games, but England manager Alf Ramsey rushes over and prevents him from doing so, shouting, don't swap shirts with that animal. There was much talk to be had after the match about unfair refereeing. The South American press claimed that the European referees were biased about them because of Argentina's group stage game against West Germany which saw another sending off of Argentina's Rafael Albrecht. They claimed that they viewed them as more violent and that this was discussed about in the referees' meetings going into the games. All of this was further compounded by Alf Ramsey's post-match conference. We have still to produce our best, and this best is not possible until we, we uh, meet the right type of opposition, and that is a team that comes out to, uh, out to play football and not act as animals. Calling them animals did not go down very well in South America, and reports about collusion started to spread like wildfire amongst the media. The fact that the president of FIFA at the time, Stanley Rouse, was English became a big talking point, and furthermore, it seemed a bit dubious that the referees chosen to officiate the two quarterfinal games containing South American teams were European. Specifically, a German ref for the England vs Argentina game and an English ref for the West Germany vs Uruguay game, 
which was also undergoing massive scrutiny for how the refereeing was handled. You see, as England was battling Argentina, simultaneously Uruguay vs West Germany was being played north of London at the Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield. In that game, an early header from Uruguay is cleared off the line by a German hand, but no call is given by the referee. Then, in the second half, two Uruguayans are sent off within five minutes of each other, both straight sending offs. And as a result, Uruguay is unable to really compete with nine men, and they go on to lose the match 4-0. And disgracefully, the two-time World Cup champions drop out of the tournament. Oh man, we've got missed calls, three sending offs, and borderline racist comments about South Americans. Guys, I guess it's safe to say that there was some kind of agenda going on against the South American teams here, as they were the biggest threat to England lifting the trophy. And we haven't even talked about Brazil yet. Imagine you're Pele, the best player the world has ever seen and you arrive with your team at the Heathrow airport after a long 12-hour flight from Brazil, and the team bus is nowhere to be seen. Then, to add insult to injury, the Silicon arrives at their training ground in Bolton, only to discover that the grass hadn't been cut and there were no goalposts. Insane, right? But guess what? They weren't the only team to be stuck in this predicament. Argentina also had arrived to their training ground to discover no goalposts. They would have to hire a local carpenter to knock up some wooden goalposts and borrow a set of crossbars from West Brom and Aston Villa's training ground. Then, in Brazil's opening match against Bulgaria, Pele was repeatedly kicked and fouled, resulting in him picking up an injury to his knee, causing him to miss the game against Hungary, where they lost 3-1, including having two goals disallowed. He came back for the game against Portugal, but wasn't 100%, and unfortunately was about to receive the same treatment. Just 29 minutes into the game, Pele was fouled by Portugal's João Marais, and when he gets back up to try and play on, João fouls him again, this time a bit harder, and the referee doesn't even book him for the challenge. They end up losing 3-1, and Pele was basically a spectator for the rest of the game, as there were no subs at the time. And to put the cherry on top, Brazil's first game was refereed by a German, and their other two? Yep, you guessed it, refed by Englishmen. And a prime 25-year-old Pele gets knocked out at the group stage with his back-to-back -back title defending team. Years later, João Havelange, president of FIFA from 1974 to 1998, claimed that both the 1966 and 1974 World Cups were fixed. That's some pretty damning evidence. But hang on just a minute. If we're going to make any conclusive statements about this cup being unfair, we're going to have to give the whole story. See, all of what I've stated is technically true, but it's all told from the South American perspective. And it's only fair now that we look at all the facts, and from an unbiased standpoint. So just a quick recap. We've talked about Argentina vs England's quarterfinal, West Germany vs Uruguay quarterfinal, and Brazil's group stage exit. The main subject of discussion for the Argentina vs England game is the refereeing, specifically Ratin sending off. So let's take a look at what actually happened. 10 minutes into the game, there's an altercation off the ball and you can see number 10, Antonio Ratin, getting in the ref's face and arguing with him. At 25 minutes, he fouls Bobby Charlton and again complains to the ref and kicks the ball away. Then we go to 33 minutes and Ratin fouls Hurst and he acts like he did nothing wrong. And then 10 seconds later, an Argentine player fouls Charlton on the edge of the box and yet again, front and center, we have Ratin getting in the ref's face. Then Kreitlin books our time for not giving 10 yards and then off the ball, Ratin starts getting right in the ref's face again, and then the infamous sending off happens. Ratin acts like he's absolutely baffled to why he's been sent off, as if he's not been a complete nuisance for the last 25 minutes. Then, he refuses to leave the pitch, demanding for a translator to explain to him as to why he's been sent off. 
Now this is where most Argentinians' argument loses any type of solidity. Even if Rudolf Kreitlin did not speak a word of Spanish, I think it's pretty clear that Ratin was not behaving in an acceptable manner regardless of the language he was speaking. He then refuses to leave the field for a full 8 minutes before policemen have to forcibly remove him from the field. Ridiculous behavior, honestly. So, suggesting that Ratin's sending off was completely unjustified is not the best take. Ratin himself would later go on to claim that he had no clue why the ref had sent him off since he didn't speak German and that it was injustice. But if you look at the events I've just went over, it's quite clear that it wasn't just that one action. It was an accumulation of poor judgment and behavior towards the match official. It was actually because of this particular incident with Ratin that the refereeing association decided to create yellow and red cards in order to make bookings more clear to the players and fans. Then, most of us know the rest. Geoff Hurst scores a 78th minute header to send England to the semi-finals, and after the game, Alf Ramsey runs over to prevent his players from swapping shirts, calling them animals. Now, this is another talking point used to suggest that the view towards South American players was biased, and therefore, the refs gave them harsher punishment. But in truth, this talk and use of the word animals only happened after the game, and was much of a result of what occurred following the final whistle. Those events being when Argentina's Ribeiro Ferrero attacked the referee ripping his shirt, while Ermindo Onega spat in the face of FIFA Vice President Harry Cavan, both earning three-match international bans. Then, an Argentinian player urinated in the tunnel, and a chair was thrown at the England dressing room. And look, I'm not gonna say I agree with Alf Ramsey's comments, but all I'm saying is if you don't want to be called animals, then I don't think this is the best way to act after a loss. The only real thing in regards to Argentina's claims for conspiracy I would agree on here is the conditions they were given to train in. Not having a good pitch or goals is pretty ridiculous and is in the control of the host country's organization committee. And I know what you might be saying if you're South American. Then why was a German chosen to ref the English game and an Englishman to ref the Germany game? But in all honesty, how does this claim even make any sense? First of all, both teams were on completely different sides of the bracket, so their immediate results didn't determine their next match. And secondly, was it really going to be that much easier for England to beat West Germany than Uruguay or vice versa? But speaking of Uruguay and Germany, we have to talk about their game. Particularly the two sending offs, as this is frequently discussed in conjunction with the Ratini sending off, as evidence for match fixing. As stated before, early on into the game, Uruguay were on the front foot, and allegedly they had a goal clear off the line by a German hand. Now, this is hard to tell with the poor quality, but it looks to be true, and if it is the case, this is some horrible officiating. But mind you, before VAR was put into place, moments like this happened all the time, even at the largest stage. In fact, ironically, something similar happened in a World Cup quarterfinal in 2010, except this time, the perpetrators themselves were Uruguay, particularly Suarez. How's that for full circle? Anyways, more realistically, the outcome of this match was more of a result of Uruguayan players losing their heads than an outright agenda. Since moments later, they concede to an annoying deflection, this would make most teams frustrated. Instead of putting their heads down and trying to overcome their injustice, the Uruguayan team would ultimately be the creators of their own downfall. After just 10 minutes into the second half, Uruguay had been reduced to 9 men, both through two acts of blatant violence. One, a kick to the stomach off the ball, and the second, a challenge with no attempt to go for the ball at all. And as a result, the Germans were easily able to put three more past them. This was truly a self-inflicted sort of masochistic deterioration. Let's move on to the next topic, and that's of Pele's mistreatment in the group stage. This Brazil team went into this tournament being the only ever international side to have defended their World Cup title besides Italy in 1938. 
and they were looking to make it a possible hat trick. But this of course did not happen. And in their first match, Brazilians like to claim that he was kicked out of the game. Here are all the challenges on Pele in the entire game. Then he injures his right knee. But am I crazy for thinking that these tackles, although pretty rough, were nothing out of the ordinary at the time, and it was unfortunate that Pele got injured, but this stuff happens. He then has to miss out against Hungary, and they're outplayed, losing 3-1. Brazil then traveled to Goodison Park for a must-win game against Portugal and Eusebio. And Pele comes back, although not at 100%. Again, there are many claims that Portugal completely kicked Pele out of the game, targeting his knee injury. And yeah, there's two instances here that are pretty targeted and borderline violent, don't get me wrong. But that would be completely ignoring the fact that this entire match was a hack fest. Both sides were out for blood and could have had multiple sending offs throughout. I mean, look at some of these tackles from Brazil on Portugal. Absolutely brutal. Now don't get me wrong, I know what it's like to have your team get knocked out of a big tournament and the places your mind goes finding things to blame. Like a Brazilian journalist writing a column to curse England to never win an international trophy outside of foreign soil. Or Argentina sending letters to the English embassy demanding an investigation into a conspiracy. I mean, heck. When I started making this video, I began to become convinced that England had fixed the refereeing to lift the title. But after taking a step back and objectively looking at all the information I had, I've come to the conclusion that the South Americans' claims were not based in fact, but mainly from emotion. If you want to see what was truly unfair in this tournament, then look no further than the final. International, no other cup final, indeed nothing Wembley ever staged, matched the glamour of this event, the final of the World Cup. Waiting in the tunnel where England on the right and West Germany. England versus West Germany in front of 94,000 fans. A hard fought battle had seen both teams leading at points in the game, but after the full 90, the score was tied 2 to 2, and the game would go into extra time. A cross from the right comes into Geoff Hurst, and he takes a heavy first touch, but then he rockets it off the crossbar and it's not in, right? It clearly bounced off the line and out. The referee's unsure, he can't tell, and runs over to the assistant on the sideline. And it's a goal? Guys, I, I can't tell you how many pictures and angles I've looked at of this goal, and every single time, I just can't see it. It's clearly on the line. In 1995, Ian Reid and Andrew Zimmerman constructed a scientific analysis using video computer robotics to analyze the two angles recorded of the goal to try and determine the point at which the ball strikes the ground. Using the six yard box and the goal posts, the scientists were able to reconstruct a model of the goal while tracking the ball separately, and in the end, it was determined that even with the maximum error of measurement, the ball would still have been at least 6 centimeters from being a goal, or about 2.3 inches. And I know what you must be thinking. Well, even if it wasn't a goal, England won 4-2, so does it really matter? Well, yeah, it kind of does because first of all, that goal completely changes Germany's tactics and mentality. I mean, Lampard knows this all too well. Still unconvinced? How about the fact that England's fourth goal was scored while there were pitch invaders on the field, causing some of Germany's defenders to stop playing? Clearly, some massive host country bias going on here, giving calls that are too close to determine to England quite unfairly. So maybe I was wrong about everything else before. Sorry South Americans, actually let's rewind real quick to right before extra time. England was winning 2-1 in the 90th minute, seconds away from lifting the 1966 World Cup. Germany attacked from the left, and a loose ball is finished in the dying embers of the game to take it to extra time. But let's slow it down. Notice anything? 
a little slower this time, and right there. The ball strikes the German player on the arm, causing it to drop perfectly into the path of Weber at the back post. And I can guarantee you've probably never heard of this moment. But why? The truth? It's so easy to create a narrative about something when you only give one side of the story. And I get it. We don't like England, and most of the world actively roots against them. And trust me, I've been there myself. But in the case of answering if the 1966 World Cup was fair, I'd have to say every tournament has its refereeing controversies, but when looked at as a whole, the answer is yes.